Hello my friend, Carla Morrow here with Dragon Lady Art Studio. I am here showing our first ever Patreon tutorial. I'm excited to get these started. I've wanted to do tutorials for a while now. I just haven't had the, the time or resources to be able to get them done. So this is the very first one. I'm doing the little autumn dragon that I did as a Patreon exclusive back in November of, of uh, 2007, not 07. That's quite a jump there. Um, yeah, this will be exciting. This will be the first time I've done a tutorial and I'm gonna, it's, it's gonna be about an hour long. I've taken this footage from the Facebook live feeds where I did this live over Facebook over the course of about two nights. The painting took approximately six hours to do. You can see my setup here. It's the sketchbook that I did the original piece in. Uh, I did it in blue pencil um, and then went over it in black ink. I'll go over how I set up paintings probably in another tutorial um, along with going over my supplies and my palettes. All of my paint that I use, 95% of it's going to be Daniel Smith paint, uh, watercolor, professional grade watercolors. I have a couple of tubes of M. Graham, which is a really unique watercolor. It's based in the binder in it that holds the pigment as honey, <clears throat> which is really cool. But uh, because I use my paint very, very heavily, I don't use the M. Graham very much because the honey tends to stay pretty sticky. So I've got the sketch here and I've already transferred it to my board, though the uh, painting surface that I'm using here is a watercolor block. Now for my regular full-size paintings I don't often use watercolor blocks, but they're perfect for these small patron exclusive paintings and I have one laying around that I should probably use. When I start my paintings uh, I lay down water first in the areas that I'm starting. So this one I'm going to start on the background. I want a nice washy light blue kind of clear sky background and I add just plain water, you can kind of see the reflection there, to the paper, uh, and then I drop in color. Uh, the, the water makes almost kind of a, a lube base, a lubricant base for your paint to travel in, and you're not getting any hard edges. I can really, I can drop in pure pigment and then fade it out <clears throat> as I get further to the edges, which makes a really nice uh, washy translucent effect. For this particular sky, I'm using a single tone, and if I can find the right palette here, I can tell you exactly the color that I'm using for this particular background. Sorry, I have like 15 of these darn palettes out and can never remember which one I'm using. So this one is going to be the Sleeping Beauty Turquoise uh, with the Daniel Smith's uh, paints, that's going to be a Primatech color. It's actually ground turquoise. Uh, the stone itself is ground to a really fine uh, powder that can be mixed with their binder. So I'm just adding in more water and working the background out a little bit. I really like the, uh, the kind of slightly more teal, warmer tone to this blue. Um, I think it makes a really pretty sky color adding more water, and now I'm trying to keep the water just to where I want the paint to flow. I am trying to keep it off of the rest of the dragon, off the leaves, things like that. The particular brush that I'm using to add water is a synthetic tip brush. Uh, the synthetics, there's, there's two different kinds of brushes that you're normally going to use. It's going to be a synthetic or a natural. Synthetics tend to hold their tips a little better, um, but they don't hold near as much water or as much paint. Um, they're going to be a little more springy where a water, a natural brush is going to hold more water. I use both simultaneously depending on the look that I want. Usually for the backgrounds I do use a synthetic because I can be a little harder on them. Um, almost a scrubbing type of motion when I add in my paint. I don't even remember what brand of brush that is. I, I think I inherited these from my grandmother. Silver something. I've used them so much, the, the brand marking has been wiped off of it, but they're really nice. Silver white, and I'm not entirely sure the brand. The brush that I was using there was a, an eight brushes go in size all the way from like triple zero for the smallest all the way up to you know 20s and 30s for their big inch multiple inch brushes two inch brushes things like that here I'm adding in the branch now 
the the paper is still I, I try to let it dry as much as possible but my blue is still gonna be ever so slightly damp here so I have to be really careful when I put in my my brown so that is gonna be a uh, wet on dry using wet paint on dry paper to get a more fine detailed edge uh, the wet on wet works really nice for your blending and your fading out where the wet on dry which is using wet paint on dry paper is going to be good for your edges, your harder edges. Uh, I do use a hair dryer. I have actually had that hair dryer since I was 16. My parents bought it for me, you know, as you're getting older and starting to use, you know, more and more beauty products and things like that. Maybe I was 14 or 15, but um, I've had that hair dryer a long time and I'm going to be very sad when it finally croaks, but I only use it for painting. I think I've used it for my hair a mere handful of times. Um, is going like crazy. Sorry guys. I really want to try to get this uh, recorded in one shot so we may have some disturbances. If it gets real bad I'll edit them out. But So here I've added in the soft base, uh, very very light wash of the base color that I wanted and then over the top of that I've started adding uh, veins in the, the wood to mimic the bark and then I'm adding in a, a subsequently darker and darker tones to get my shadows and the texture in the bark. What, I, what I'm trying to go for with this one is I really want the dragon and the leaves to be the most dominant parts in the painting. So everything else around it is going to be pretty soft. to add in adding in water for the dragon um, this was an autumn dragon so I'm gonna be using a lot of yellows uh, reds and oranges it's a lot of those warm colors I went with a leafy pattern for the uh, the gaps in the wings as well to kind of mimic the look of those falling leaves I'm really happy with the effect I'm really happy I did this dragon particular for Patreon, uh, although it is a design that I think I may turn into a full-size, larger painting later on. The Patreon patri paintings, the blah, blah, let's try that again, the Patreon exclusive paintings have been a lot of fun. I'll be working on my third one this month, and it's just for patrons, so they won't be anywhere else. I'm thinking about putting them together in a coloring book maybe at the end of the year. Um, I know you can, I'm, I'm doing the downloadable coloring pages for my $5 and up tier, but it might be nice to have them as a physical coloring book that you know you guys could either download or maybe carry a handful of them to order. It's, it's an idea that I'm playing around with, but I have a lot of ideas for the oncoming year, so we'll see what all I get done. And I really like the Daniel Smith yellows. They're really vibrant. I start again with my very, very light wash to kind of get some color down. And I'm using the yellow as, as a to really brighten up the colors that'll be added on top of it, which you'll see here shortly. I tend to use homogeneous colors or very similar colors to what I'm doing over the top for my under layers. I do keep a color wheel uh, near my desk and my color swatches so I know exactly what all of my paints look like. The more you practice with your paints, the more you know what paint is going to do what and what color is going to do what. I said I will, I will definitely go into a, a much more in-depth uh, tutorial about colors, why I choose them, what colors do what and things like that. I do discuss it when I do my live streams, so those are all still available on Facebook. If you would like to watch this entire, the stream in its entirety without the speed up, please, you know, feel free to check out my Facebook page, uh, Dragon Lady Art Studio, facebook.com slash Dragon Lady Art Studio. I'm starting to add in the, the top uh, colors, the oranges. 
one of the, the really special characteristics about watercolor is light filters through each layer of color and bounces off the color underneath it. So you, you really want to layer different colors to get different effects and that light bouncing around in there. Um, a lot of times for greens I'll, I'll lay down yellows and then lay down blues on top of it to get certain shades of green. And this one you can see that, that orange is quite light uh, and the light bounces off of it because of the yellow underneath. Orange and blue are opposite colors on the color wheel, so I went with... That's why the <coughs> I decided to go with the blue that I went with. Um, they're a little closer, it is a warmer blue. It has warmer undertones, kind of yellowy undertones, but... I'm quite happy with how it came out. There's my hair dryer again. Here I'm adding a more brown tone, adding into my shadows, starting to darken the areas that are that need to be darkened. Any area you have that's away from light will be dark. I know that's kind of a Captain Obvious comment, but... <laughs> I'm using a very warm brown, very reddish based uh, brown color for these particular shadows. really having a lot of fun with this little guy. I love I love the whole painting process. I love adding color. I love bringing something to life and seeing how it develops. Uh, I'm not not one of those artists that can just, you know, plop down and paint completely organically. I have to have the the image completely finished in my head before I can ever hit pencil to paper and, and there has to be a solid plan of the direction that I'm going into. Not knocking those artists by any stretch of the imagination. I I'm jealous of the ability to be able to sit down and just go. Um, that's that's not a skill that is in my my repertoire, but I like seeing the piece build up, uh, layer upon layer. And because he's so tiny and fine, I didn't want. A whole lot of heavy scale work. Some of my pieces I tend to do pretty, pretty heavy, definite scale lines and whatnot, and I really wanted him to be subtle. The, the gradations and the changes from one color to the other to be slow and steady. Here I'm going darker with a darker brown. In the description of this video, I think I'll try to add a list of the colors, the actual colors that I did use and where I used them. I am a really horrible paint hoarder, so anytime I have a, a few extra bucks in my account, I usually buy paint. I'm toying with the idea of doing a Patreon color of the month where I'll pick a color and do a painting all with that one color or review the color or talk about the color or something. I'm definitely passionate about my Daniel Smith paints, that's for sure. There is there is a huge difference between studio grade and professional grade, and, and a lot of it is preference until you get, you know, on the further ends of the spectrum. I mean, a, a Daniel Smith paint compared to a, like a Rose Art or a Crayola paint is going to be vastly different from like a Daniel Smith paint and a Winsor Newton paint. Winsor Newton are, are a professional level as well, but I've, I've never cared much for them personally. Um, 
They don't seem to be quite as pigmented as the Daniel Smith paints are. That's going to be your difference between professional level paint and um, like student grade or hobby grade paint is the amount of pigment and the types of pigment or binders that they use. Crayola is going to be a lot of filler, um, or the, the student grade paints in general are going to be a lot of filler, where paints like M. Graham, Daniel Smith, and uh, Windsor Newton are going to be have much more pigment. The pigment to binder ratio is, is much, much higher. Um, I originally started using Koi brand paints, and those are paints that my mother-in-law introduced me to. They were fabulous. I loved them for a very long time. They're smoother and very creamy. Um, I don't remember when or how or why I made the jump to Daniel Smith. I think I was researching light fastness and discovered that the Koi, the Koi brand watercolor is as nice as they were and as much as I enjoyed them still didn't have the ultra light fastness. And there's, there's things that Daniel Smith's paints do the granulating colors, which means that your your paint pigment molecules actually filter down into the paper and you get a really cool kind of a sand type texture, which I, I love a lot and use a lot in my work. Uh, Koi didn't have that effect. And admittedly, I'm completely obsessed with the Primatech line of Daniel Smith paint, which is the natural pigment, or the natural uh, stone paints. They've got pie mouth and I've got Amethyst, the Sleeping Beauty Turquoise, I've got a couple of them. They're more expensive than their other paints, so I, I buy them pretty rarely, but I have a few more picked out that I want to get in the next year, if things go well. I'm starting to get pretty happy with how the color layering is going. Other than the... Uh, Oracle deck that I did for Hay House, I haven't really ever done an orange dragon before, so I am pretty happy with how he's coming along. Watercolor is a fun media to work in. You you really have to just let it be what it is. You know, it's acrylic, you can you can push and pull and manipulate and really get it into the exact spot that you want it. And the same thing with oil, you know, if you don't if you don't like something in acrylic, you can paint over the top of it. If you don't like something in oil, you can scrape it off and start again. Where watercolor, you you really have to learn what colors and what paint give you what effects and how the paints move uh, in water and dry and how they react to other colors as well. And then you can start planning out your paintings and manipulating them. One of the reasons I have so many watercolor paints is because various paints do different things. Like I mentioned a little bit ago, I had the, the granulating colors, so I have a line. I have several granulating colors in similar colors to like staining colors, which you lay down on the paper and they're really hard to lift that out back out. They stain the paper. Or non-staining, which means that you can put them down and then if you need to, you can lift them out with water or something like that, or they lift up from with other paint being applied on top of them. So I'll have three different paints in the same, or very, very similar shade of blue, but each paint color does a different thing, depending on if it's granulating, staining, or non-staining. I have a few colors that I absolutely love that I use pretty much for everything. When I do my dark blue skies, I use indigo and um, Prussian blue a lot. Prussian blue is a staining color, which means I can lay it down at the base and have it stay there, it won't lift back out. Where indigo tends to be a bit more of a lifting color, I can put it in and if I don't like where it is, I can take some water and lift it back out and, and uh, have it lift out almost fully. I also call Prussian blue a, a bully color. It's, um, if you have, if you're doing a wet on wet technique where you're just dropping in several colors and letting them bleed together, Prussian will actually push other colors out of the way. So that if you're wanting to get into watercolor, the best, the best thing you can possibly do is, is get your basic set of watercolors. You know, if, if you want to go professional and you can't afford a lot of professional color paints, 
I would suggest buying, you know, three to five colors um, and just working with those or buying a less expensive student grade paint and slowly start swapping them out, which is what I did. I think the, the set that I had, the Koi watercolor, I bought as a set of 24 and I think I spent maybe not even $30 for it. And then I slowly started buying the Daniel Smith paints. If I had a really good show or I got a bonus from work or something, I would set aside, you know, $12, $15 to buy a tube of paint. And, you know, over the course of the next seven or eight years that I've been using Daniel Smith, I now have a lot of colors. <laughs> I'll cover that in a different tutorial, but <clears throat> I do have quite a substantial collection of, of Daniel Smith colors at this point, but it was a slow turnover. Um, and anytime you get a new color, get some scrap paper, sit down, and just play with it. Don't, don't do anything for a painting, don't do anything that you're afraid you're going to mess up. Just put paint on paper. Uh, try your brushes, try <clears throat> see how it looks with a synthetic, with a synthetic brush, see what it looks like with a natural brush. Um, draw, you know, paint lines, paint squiggles, paint blocks of color, lay down water and drop it in. You know, other colors that you use often, see how it reacts um, wet on wet, either dropping in, putting down some water, putting in the color that you like, and then adding the new color and seeing how it blends and mixes. Basically just test out your paints and see if it does what you want and uh, and how you can manipulate that. And as you start to learn these things, you'll start to know, okay, this color, I want this effect and I can apply this color and I will get that effect. And then you have less goof ups. Um, I know watercolor can be a very uh, tough media to work in and playing with it and knowing your tools is gonna be the best thing that you can possibly do. When I was first learning how to do watercolor, um, I didn't I didn't go to art school or anything like that. I was self-taught via my mother-in-law uh, taught me how to draw, and I kind of taught myself how to paint, along with having art friends that I could ask questions about and things like that. Um, I read a lot of watercolor books. Stephanie Law's line of watercolor books are fabulous. On YouTube videos, thank goodness for the internet, because you know, 30 years ago it would have been a lot harder to do this, but. I watched a lot of YouTube videos, and I believe it was Cheap Joe's Art Supplies has a line of art instruction videos, and there was an artist on there who was, he was an old football player, um, he'd been retired for a long time, and he did watercolor painting now, and he was hilarious and entertaining as hell, I mean, he was so funny, and very dry humor, but he was talking about you know, spend the money and get yourself a really expensive, like, 300 pound single sheet of watercolor paper and use that to practice on. And he made a comment of, you can actually throw it in the washing machine and then hang it back out to dry. So when you're, when you're done practicing, you toss that bad boy in the washing machine, put it on a gentle cycle, and then, you know, hang it outside to dry and, and then go again. And, and it was, it was 20 minutes of, you know, don't, don't paint anything you're afraid to mess up just paint lines, just paint squiggles, just paint blocks of color. And it was such a big aha moment for me of, I, I didn't have to paint a masterpiece. And it's, I don't know if it's the society we live in now or seeing other artists create masterpieces. And it's, it's less an issue now with things like Instagram and whatnot, where you can see people's paintings in progress and practice sheets and warm ups and things like that. But 10 years ago, you know, 15 years ago, you didn't really have that ability. So the thought of just playing uh, in watercolor and not painting for a final product was so alien to me <clears throat> that watching this old football player, football player paint, you know, he's in his 60s or was in his 60s at the time, and hear him talk about just don't paint anything special and learn your tools first was, uh, was definitely a mind-blowing aha moment and one that Anytime somebody asks me about how to get started in watercolor, I always relay that information of don't paint something you're afraid to mess up because you're afraid to mess it up. You know, you don't want to touch it. You don't want to mess around. You just, you just want to get it right. And it's hard when you're working with expensive supplies to mess up. Uh, I know I've, I've thrown away whole paintings before because they weren't the colors that I wanted. And then to turn around and realize, you know, how much paint 
and really honestly with watercolor it's it's not a lot because of how much water you use um, but still it's it's a uh, cringe worthy so here I'm doing the wet on wet technique and I laid down my yellow and then I dropped in red on the other side and I'm blending them back out I use that base color of a lighter yellow and then I want a, a fade effect from one color to the other and I really like the red that I chose again I have palettes everywhere so it'll take me a minute to dig around and find what color I used but it was a red <laughs> And I was kind of playing around. I started that first one, I laid down my yellow, and then I dropped in my red, and I realized I wanted to do an orange fade in the middle. So I ended up tossing a uh, orange in between those two colors, and I wasn't quite happy with the way the fade looked. So for the second segment there, I put in the yellow, and then I did the orange, and then I added in the red. And that's something that I would normally have done, and for some reason just didn't start that way, but I, there, there is still a little trial and error in my paintings. It's not mechanically rote whenever I do a painting. I do, I do still, you know, try and figure things out and play as I go along, see how, what color affects what and things like that, but for the most part I do have them planned out pretty well before I start. definitely very excited how this fade was coming out. I, uh, I'm pretty darn happy with it. I don't do enough fades like that, and it's something that I think I'll bring in more in the next year. Yeah, adding in that very sopping wet yellow, getting it where I want it. my orange. Fading them out, I'll use a, a wet, clean brush for a lot of those fades. You know, when you get your paint down and then figure out how and where exactly you want your fade, you wash your brush and kind of use the wet brush to push things around a little bit. something in my computer fan. That wasn't good. So the base yellow that I used is a bismuth. And then the orange that I was layering in is a gamboge or a new gamboge. Um, I have both. And then finally the red um, was a pretty bright red and it was a peril crimson, which I believe is an M. Graham color. The other two are Daniel Smith. And as it dries, I wanted to deepen that red a little bit, so I went ahead and used a dry, uh, a wet on dry, so wet paint on dry paper, and then faded it out to water. Unless I'm working wet on wet, I really try hard to make sure my paper is as dry as possible. Um, otherwise you'll get some bleed backs and effects that you're not really wanting. Um, so there's a few ways you can tell if your paper is completely dry. Um, first off, the sheen is gone. If you hold it up and move it back and forth across the light, you won't see a shine. Second is with a clean finger, uh, feel the temperature of your paper. If your paper is still cool to the touch, that means that it's still damp down into the core of your paper and you want to let that dry. Um, I use, like I said, the hair dryer. And my hair dryer, and I think they all come with this now, but you know, back in the 90s, they didn't all have cool settings. 
but I've got a, a warm cool setting and I'll start it on a cool setting and then warm it up to uh, a warmer setting so the paper is actually warm to the touch and then I let the temperature of the paper come back down to room, room temperature and then I can usually paint my clean lines over the top of that. Uh, thinking about that hair dryer, I can't believe that's, yeah, I think I got it in 96 or 95. <laughs> it's been my faithful companion for more than 20 years. The painting that is seen is staggering. Seriously, you don't need a fancy hair dryer, just go out and get the cheapest one you can, you know, from any of the dollar stores or wherever. That darker yellow that I was using is an Azo yellow, it's one of my favorite colors as far as the yellows go. I don't know enough yellow dragons either, I need to... I really stick with the cool, cool side of the, the spectrum. Blues, purples, and I guess reds too, but I have plans for other, other dragons. Well, I mean, always have plans for other dragons, but I definitely have a lot of plans for different pieces this year. And once I get the uh, Language of Flowers dictionary finished, I'll be... doing more open open dragons that aren't tied to a project. The brush that I'm using here is a natural fiber brush and it holds a lot of paint. So I was really wanting to make sure that I could get all of my color in in one swath as far as these sections go. Um, because if it dries out and then you try to add more paint, you'll start getting the lines and it's really hard to get the blending done and faded back out. So I wanted a brush that would hold a lot of paint and so I'm using the natural brushes here. I believe that actually is a Kalinsky hair brush which for years you couldn't get because of the um, laws regarding fur trading, which is really interesting. Yeah, they're Princeton Elite uh, Kalinsky brushes. Some of my favorite brushes ever. One of the various websites I order from several of them had a huge sale on Kalinsky brushes and I jumped all over it. They're expensive. Um, red squirrel hair, I believe is, is is really good too. Um, if you can, definitely get a couple of natural hair brushes to keep in your collection um, for very specific uses. Uses a good expensive brush will last a lot longer than a a less expensive brush. I do have some cheap brushes. I use them as mops, things like that, but they shed a lot of hair. So every once in a while, you see me pick up the brush and pull something off the tip, and that's usually because a hair has come loose. Or more common, there's the dog hair stuck in it, which happens a lot too. Funny side story, I made a, a banner for my backdrop for art shows, and it's an 8 foot by 10 foot banner. This piece is huge. It's uh, based on the blue dragon that I have that's coming out of the spell book surrounded by green magic and standing on a like a summoning circle and uh, I scanned the piece in and it's an it's a 11 by 14 piece 11 inches by 14 so it's not very big so I had to scan it in at a super crazy high detail so I could blow it up to eight feet by ten feet and I didn't realize it until I had ordered my banner and that a dog hair had gotten on the scan and I was able to fix it in the image on the the prints and everything and you know it's maybe half an inch in the prints but when you blow it up to eight feet by ten feet there's like a three foot long dog hair in the middle of my banner now that I can't do anything about and I can see it so here I'm trimming the tip of one of my brushes that is a it's a little bit older brush that I've had for a while and it starts fraying 
and there was one hair that was unruly that kind of had gotten bent at some point, whether I was washing the brush or it got knocked on my desk or something, but a bristle or two got bent in the opposite direction, and I used scissors and I just trimmed those off. But here's where I'm starting to get into the, I want a harder line for the wing instead of the soft uh, gradient. So I used the, the wet on dry technique of wet paint, <clears throat> a pretty thick, uh, thicker wet paint uh, along the edge and then faded it back up as I went further up the wing. Continuing to add those details along the wings and cleaning up my lines a little bit on the dragon itself. I want to get those wing edges as crisp as I can, so I'm using a heavier, heavier paint, uh, not a lot of water. This is going to be pretty close to right out of the tube, just for the edges, and then I'll fade it up uh, to get a little bit of a gradient in along the back edge where it meets the wing. When I buy paints, I buy them in a tube, and then I squeeze them into uh, the palette, and then let them dry. So before any of my painting sessions, I start about 15 minutes before I intend on sitting down and painting, and I wet all of the colors that I'm going to use. That gives me about 15 to 20 minutes of the water to soak in, and you have them so they're almost the same, about the same quality as they would be right out of the tube. I'm not having to scrub paint in order to lift pigment up or anything like that. It's a nice, soft pliable paint already, uh, and then I'll transfer that into those long square uh, areas of the palette to actually use my water in, and that's where I get either a lighter, softer paint color, or I'll use it right out of the, the first top well to get the, the tube color. And I do use tube colors a lot. Um, I know a lot of artists who mix their paints, and I think that's awesome. I really like bright tube colors. just person, you know, personally. Though I do mix colors quite a bit, uh, both either in a palette or on the paper. There's several different ways of mixing your colors. There's the glazing technique of glazing one color on top of another. I mentioned earlier about the light passing through subsequent layers of watercolor and, and bouncing around so you get you know, if you put down a yellow base with a blue over the top, you'll get a nice green. So that's one way of doing it, is layering it on the paper. The other, another way is on a palette, where you have a clean palette with a mixing tray, and you actually mix your two colors until you get the shade that you want. Or you can mix them on the paper. So I will lay down water, and I do this for skies a lot, where I lay down water and I'll lay down a purple color and a blue color and kind of push them around until they mix and swirl together. And this would have been day two, so I've had a day to kind of look at it, decide what I wanted to add, uh, what shadows I wanted to darken, things like that. Shadows are something that I would like to work on, or lighting. Uh, work on more personally this, this year, including taking classes and things like that. I know the basic, you know, the further away something gets from a light source, the darker it is. But as far as applying certain types of shadows and things like that, I know it's something that I'm lacking experience on. shadows slowly. All in all, in the body, um, one, two, three, four, I believe I used four or five different paint shades on the body itself in order to get the look that I was wanting. A 
watercolor is a fast media and the fact that you it dries so quickly you don't have a lot of working time with the paint but it's also slow in the fact that you have to go lighter and add more colors more layers so with acrylic you can you do add a lot of layers of acrylic and oil as well but you get a you know a similar effect of right out of the tube if you don't want a layer I've kicked around the idea several times over the years of going back to acrylic. I started in acrylics uh, and then moved to watercolor after working in ink for a while. I did a lot of work in Prismacolor markers and Copic markers. And watercolor gave me a similar close enough effect to the ink that I went with watercolor, which is why I made that decision. Um, But I've kicked around the idea of moving back into acrylic just for the drying factor and the mess up factor of being able to paint over something if it, you know, didn't make me happy or change colors and not lose the whole piece. But I haven't been able to yet. I still just stick with watercolor. I love the the textures and the patterns and how watercolor can be used. I did buy acrylics last year. They're sitting in a drawer. about the time I'll start nitpicking over a painting, which putting in those final details, clearing up edges, making sure my my lines are sharp, deciding where needs where I need to add in a little more shadow. some leaf designs down his spine that I'm adding in here. about the paper that I'm working on. It's Arches watercolor uh, and it's a cold press 140 pound. It is in a block which means that it's sheets of paper all stacked together and then coated along the edges with a, like a rubber um, and it keeps it stretched. Watercolor as you get it wet the paper will tend to buckle so I either tape it down or I'm using these blocks um, for the Patreon stuff, the smaller paintings, which I like. Or I do watercolor paper mounted on a board, which I will do another 
uh, tutorial on how I do that at a later date. The size is 12 by 16 and I like it because I can get two paintings out of two smaller paintings out of each page. They're kind of divided in half. You can see that second half there I haven't used yet. I end up using it on the Christmas dragon the following month which I will probably do another tutorial on as well if this goes over well. Hopefully you guys are enjoying it <clears throat> and it's not completely boring. Nothing like watching paint dry, right? Well, I'm so punny. So here I'm really adding in the leaves. Uh, I wanted a mixture of different color combinations for the leaves. Most of them are yellow based and then I wanted more orangey leaves or red leaves or brown leaves to kind of give some color variance. So I kind of decide on what color family I'm going to use and, and just jump around and add that particular color in. So here I'm painting the orange ones. For this base color of orange, I'm going fairly heavy with the paint color. The water I'm using, the water paint mix in the, the long rectangular wells, is probably about the consistency of milk as far as water to paint ratio goes. I don't often go more watery than that unless I'm doing a really, really light wash. That's something, again, you'll play around with. Different colors will will need different thicknesses or heaviness of your water mixture. Drawing leaves is always is something that I've always found difficult for some odd reason. I have a really hard time with the proportions and the shapes of leaves. I've gotten a little bit better in the more recent years, especially with all of the flowers I just painted, but it's something that I definitely need more practice at. And going back and reviewing this video now as I am, I, I wish that I had painted a lot of the leaves a lot larger. I think if I redo this dragon in the future, he'll be a smaller dragon amongst, amongst much bigger leaves. I like the idea of kind of little dragons tucked around in hidden places. That yellow and orange color palette, uh, going from left to right is Peril Orange, Gamboge, Nickel Titanium Yellow, Azo Yellow, and Bismol. I have two yellow palettes, but that's the one that I use mostly. If I remember correctly, none of those are granulating colors. They're all mildly staining or not staining at all, which makes them good for upper layers. I wanted my leaves to be pretty contrasted. Uh, 
Uh, so for the most part, they're each getting three colors. There's the yellow base color, there's the secondary base color, which is the orange or the red uh, or the yellow, and those colors I went pretty intense, pretty bright on. And then there's the edging color, which I'm trying to do fairly dark, uh, mostly in the brown shades or the darker reds. This is a fairly simple piece with not a lot of scale work or extreme details, so I wanted that I wanted the leaves to pop out a bit more by using a high contrast uh, in the coloration of them. these ones I'm being really careful on and making sure that I had to make sure the wings underneath were dry so I finished the wings the day before and then I'm working on the leaves today so I didn't have any bleeding of paint into the wings. I wanted that edge to be really nice and crisp. This is kind of where watercolor really starts to shine as I can, I believe it or not, I don't have a lot of patience. <laughs> so being able to get these colors in on the smallest scale and having them dry fairly quickly and then being able to move on to the next one makes me really, really happy. There's another dog hair in my brush. If you're not careful with that, you'll leave a double a double trail because that one hair will will leak paint onto the paper, and it wouldn't be the first time that's happened to me. So similar to the wings, what I do is I add a very dry, thick paint to the edge and then use clean water to fade that into the, into the center. And then when it's still wet, I take my lighter color and I dollop it in the middle, which helps push the outer paint back out a little bit and you still get that gradient, that ombre effect. Who am I kidding? I just wanted to use the word ombre this entire video. I'm really excited that I did this piece. Autumn is my favorite time of year. I love the cooler days and sitting outside on my porch without being overheated and all of the colors. I think I've used this fade out technique on <clears throat> more on this piece than I have my last three paintings. I like the effect how some of the leaves came out like they look like they're on fire.
a good example. You can see that leaf looks very, very wet. The way the reflection of the uh, light is off the water. Decided I wanted to darken my branch a little bit in there. Cleaning up some of my lines as well as I use that brown. There's two overlapping leaves there, so I want to make sure my hedges are really crisp so it just doesn't blend into itself. Pretty close to finishing it up here, last few leaves. If you guys want to practice this wet on wet or fading technique, I would suggest doing like squares, blocks of color, and using your fade from one end of the block to the other. And I would do it with both a clear uh, color and then fading it out to water, and then two colors, things like that. It's also a good way to see how colors react to each other. Um, warm tones versus cool tones. And the more you practice with how your colors react to each other, the less often you're going to make mud, which is really easy to do, especially in watercolors. You start doling down your colors. I probably have the opposite color or problem where I tend to make my colors all really intense and don't use enough variants of color. Do the last few cleanup, I'm adding in some veins to the leaf texture along his spine, and I'll be adding them into the leaves as well. We're wrapping up now. I hope you enjoyed this video and this mild tutorial. Uh, I don't. I hope I went into some depth and you guys 
learned something. This is the first tutorial I've ever done, so I'll definitely try to clean it up for later videos. I do want to do a tutorial on my color palettes and my paints and how I prep uh, art and paintings, art for paintings, and get the artwork transferred and things like that. So look for those in a later video, either later this month, next month, somewhere in there. So thank you very much, guys. I appreciate all your help and support, and enjoy. If you would like the coloring uh, piece for the, the coloring page for this piece, it is back in, I think I released it in December, so you'll be able to find it there. And thank you very much.